world and the foolishness of religious things that are going on nowadays. Let's just read the first four or five verses here and then we'll pause for a minute and I'll come back to the Bible after Brother Larry prays for us. Then Joshua chapter 20. And we'll begin in verse number 1. The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares or unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall uh, be your refuge from the avenger of blood. For when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they, the ones that have led him in the city, shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not aforetime. Brother Larry, would you pray and please and ask the Lord to help us? Lord, we come before you. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you and pray this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus and because of him, we lift and surrender this service to you, Lord. Best we know how. I pray God that you might be on your preacher, be on the message that's given to him, Lord, to be used, Lord, for our hearing. I pray for our hearts this morning, our, that our minds might be clear as well, Lord, to take in the Word. I pray, God, that you'd use it in our lives. I pray, God, that you might help us with it. And I pray, God, that anything that might be an offense or a distraction this morning, I'll be put aside and be even removed. I ask you for help this morning. Might you rest on your man. Might you be on us with your Word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated and thanks again for coming and all the visitors that are here. We don't want to embarrass you, but we are very glad that you're with us. And if you'll see somebody, we'll be glad to give you a visitor's card. Tells us you'll, tells you a little bit about us, uh, but I'm sure that you probably are aware of those things. And if not, we would be more than happy to spend some time talking with you. I want you to notice right off the bat that the misconception of the house of God is to cover up for things that are done that are done intentionally and on purpose, whether of ill will or because of hate or a malicious intent. Uh, they used to say in the old days that when you run to the church, you run to a place of sanctuary, and many people that have done things that are wrong, for instance murder, ran to the church and they say, well, you can't get me because I'm in a place of sanctuary. We might apply that spiritually speaking, but the church is not to be a bastion of people who don't do things right lawfully and legally. The church is not supposed to be a place that you hide things from the Lord and you're one person on the outside and another person on the inside. Now, oftentimes the difficulty for a pastor is, is that he has to be able to preach things to recognize that sometimes the problem is the people that are here who have yet to face their own problems. But that's not the message today. The message today is not to give you an idea that I just do whatever wickedness I want to do and continue to do it, and then I come in before the Lord and nobody can touch me. The Holy Spirit should have already touched you. The Holy Spirit should have already told you that what you're doing is wrong and it's improper, and you need to get that thing fixed. That's the misunderstanding about church today, is there should be an element of conviction when the preacher preaches what thus saith the Lord, that you recognize you're not living, not according to the preacher's standard or the deacon's, or the trustees or whoever you want to put in there, but according to what God's standard is. God's standard for right living is Jesus Christ. And God's standard for uh, the way that things ought to be done is found in the general orders and SOPs that's right there in your King James Bible. The problem is not the one that wrote the book. The problem is not the book. The problem is not being obedient to the book. I made a habit a long time ago, it's not on every single page, but I started signing pages in my Bible when I read over them. And the reason I did that was is I had to sign every general order and SOP that I had received it, I had read it, and I understood it. And what I found out was is I was held accountable to it, so I couldn't say, oh, I didn't, I didn't read that or understand it. And I was required to sign that. Had my signature in a big manual that was in the back of my car like that. There was a rule for everything back in those days. Nowadays, you know what's a strange thing is? Is you find when it comes to Christianity, people think Christianity is a, a, a rule of no rules. 
That's not true. I'm not a legalist. I don't believe that, they're, that, that you're supposed to be locked down. I'm just being locked down. I've known people that have everything right on the outside. They're just as mean as a snake. I mean, they got all kind of anger and wrath and bitterness and emulations and strife and create divisions and problems and all that. The bottom line of that is the Bible says to you, only by what cometh contention? The, only by what cometh contention? Pride. There's pride there. I, I refuse to capitulate. I refuse to bow. I refuse to do. Why? I'm right. You're wrong. Well, that's not a Christian attitude. Jesus Christ was right and He offered Himself up as a sacrifice for you. You don't see that much anymore nowadays. Nowadays, the world's ways have come in and it's all about everybody making it about them. You don't see the bigger picture of what's going on. You don't recognize those things. Church is not a bastion for wicked and evil people to come and to hide out. That's not what the passage teaches. This is an individual who had no ill will, had no intentions of, of doing what he did. It's what we would call nowadays, I guess it's still in the book, to be called manslaughter. It's unintentional. It's accidental. There was no ill will. There was no lying in wait. There was no premeditation. There was no trying to go after the guy. In Numbers chapter 35, he's not intentionally trying to murder a guy and then hide behind it like it's some kind of an accident. That's not where the cities of refuge are for. What I want to draw to your attention is, is that when the individual with the right reason and the right motive came to the gate of the city, much like the church, he came in there and he said, listen, I need some help. And this is what happened and this is what occurred. And the elders of the city, they allowed him to come into that place. And here's the thing. Oftentimes we're a little too persnickety about who comes in. It's not up to us to determine what happens is, is the Lord says, let them come in there. The Lord sorts them out over time. You understand that. But we have individuals that have been in here who've been through everything you can possibly imagine. You say, what have they been through? I wouldn't dare tell you because you'd put it on Facebook before I got finished with church today. Because anybody who is overly obsessed with what everybody else is doing is full of themselves. And the next thing you know, it's you're always showing everybody else's fault. And the only reason is, is to show you that you're without fault. You haven't looked in the mirror lately. Amen. And so people come here, but can I say this to you? The people that are hurting and the people that have problems, where would you like them to go to get help? How should we treat those individuals? Should we treat them as if you've never had a problem, you've never been hurting, you never needed any help at all? Should you treat them as if, hey, we're only for the well? Or should we treat them as, hey, they need some help, and if that's the case, we allow them to come in? Well, they might hurt us. They might. That's the risk that you take. Listen, there have been times when I took somebody to an ER for their own good, for their own help, and they wound up hurting the very doctor that was trying to help them to get better because every time somebody tried to help them, they always thought somebody was trying to hurt them because they had a misconception of what the white coat was trying to do for them. I told you about the elderly lady who wasn't big as a minute, about big as your pinky finger, who had been dehydrated for a number of days laying in there in that little shotgun house. And when rescue finally got her there, she fought the rescue guys, she fought the nurses, she fought the doctor. They had to literally hold her down and put her in restraints in order to put an IV bag in her because they thought they knew what was wrong to, with her. But all she did was snarl and growl at everybody that came around. But the doctors amazingly didn't walk off because she had a bad attitude. See, doctors can't just quit doing what they're doing just because the patient doesn't like what they're doing. But oftentimes the church does. There's individuals that have to keep doing what they're doing. Listen, you don't get to quit being a mama just because the kid's grown up and got out of the house. There's certain responsibilities that come that just because everything doesn't go the way you feel that it'll go, that you get to walk away from the responsibility. Somebody else may give in, but you can't give in. You say, well, I got things I got to do. I still have to pay the rent and I still have to do the things that are required for me to do. You might have people that walk out of your class in school and never want anything else to do. Oh, well, sorry, but I got to graduate because I paid for a course. But ladies and gentlemen, here's the downside to this thing is that sometimes when people are needing help, oftentimes not only are we careful or too careful about who we allow in, but oftentimes we don't protect them for what's out there trying to get them back out there. 
In that passage right there, you know what he said? It's the responsibility of the elders of that city, the very ones that let them in, to protect them when that revenger of blood comes around and he's looking to get them out there and the individuals are supposed to step out in a sense and put a wall between them and uh, the individual trying to get them and say, listen, he's pled his cause before us, we find his cause to be just and he's allowed to stay here and as long as he's here, you're not allowed to come in and take him out. But we don't see that happening sometimes in churches nowadays. We don't hold the line. We continue to let them siphon things out in the world that got them out there in the first place and they come back in for help and then all of a sudden they come back out. I think of the story of the prodigal. And the prodigal, when he finally, he's done bad things, he's terrible. And he went out and spent all that he had. And when he came to himself, the Bible said he came back. Right? Right? You don't know everything he did, but the elder brother seems to have an idea of what he thinks he did because the elder brother is thinking, this is what I would do if I had been out there. And so he accuses him a lot of things, and the elder brother refuses to come in because they're rejoicing over the individual that went out and came back in, and now he's out there because in his mind, he's so righteous, he's not going to come in there and say, man, I'm glad my brother's back home, and I'm glad the father is happy. No, he's upset because you know what he said? You never killed a fatty calf for me, and you never let me have a party for my friends, and you never did anything for me. So you know what? I'm not going to rejoice over the fact that your boy came home. Well, aren't you happy, the servant said, that your father's happy? No, I'm not happy at all. You know what happened with that prodigal? He literally stayed right outside the door. But in that story right there, have you ever noticed that the story ends at that particular point? I know the story is to the Pharisees. I know it's about the Pharisees. I know it's about the fact that they wind up getting locked out because they can't stand the idea that the Lord would be so merciful to a sinner as to allow them to come back. And I think sometimes in the church today, it galls some of you that have never left that somebody might come back you don't like. Is that too plain for you for a Sunday? Maybe I should have said that on Sunday night. But you know what? If that was your husband or your wife, if that was your kid, if that was your grandkid, if that was somebody you cared about, but you see, you never think that'll be you. You never think that'll be somebody in your family. And sometimes that attitude prevails that people get the impression, well, I can't go back to church there. I would never be welcome. Where did they get that idea when it came to Jesus Christ? Could I ask you this? Are you familiar with 1 John 1 9? I think that says, and if I'm correct, in 1 John 1 9, does not it say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of some of the unrighteousness that the people. What does he say? Well, let me ask you a question. If he does that. What business is it of yours as to who you should or shouldn't let into His house? See, this is His house. It's not your house. Can I just say that? The house doesn't belong to the elder brothers. It belongs to the Father. And the Father can throw a party for whoever He Johnny well pleases, and maybe the party's being thrown to upset the elder brothers to show us our own self-righteousness and arrogance. You say, get on to the houses and show us who all is welcome. Why? You never see yourself there, ever. You never see yourself as one of the individuals that needs to come back in. Some of you are so far right now, I could take my friend 7mm Magnum and I couldn't hit you at 400 yards or 1,000 yards because you're sitting right in here, elder brother, and you know what you're doing? You think you would never fit any one of them people. I didn't have to come to the Lord for all those kinds of things. That'd never be me. Not me. I'd never leave the house. Boy, you better be on your face saying, Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner, and protect me, because without God's grace on you, your capacity to do evil is among you right now. You say, what? I'm talking about your flesh. Don't even worry about the devil right now. Everything in the world will send you to the far country from a pew. I like what the old preacher used to say. Turn the air conditioner on, please. I like what the old preacher used to say. The old preacher used to say, there'll be as many people going to hell from a pew as there will be from a bar stool. But the problem is, is that our churches today are full of people that usually sit on a bar stool, but they're sitting in a pew. And all they do is judge everybody and who they think is and who isn't and who should be and who shouldn't be. And they lose sight of the bigger picture. Can I just get an amen to that or something? 
Can I say that a church full of elder brothers is no benefit to the hurting and to the helpless and to the hopeless and the people that have got problems and difficulties? Can I say this? This church is established as a hospital. We're not trying to get together a militia to try to come against the government or against the police or we're trying to make it a voting precinct or we're trying to turn it into an aerobics thing or do couples therapy or marriage seminars. We are here for the purpose, sole purpose of trying our best to help hurting people. We ever get to the point that we think that wounded people when they come back, guess what? They are messed up as a soup sandwich. I can't tell you how many people have already contacted me. And if you want to believe I'm embellishing it and you know that I'm exaggerating it, I can't tell you how many people that came and they got a blessing out of just being here and being ministered to. With over a hundred bags and with kindness and being taken out to dinner and being given money on the side. Things I didn't even know were going on. So and so helped me here and so and so helped me there and so and so did this and so and so did that. That's a great testimony. I came there ready to get out but I'm in again and then parentheses at least for another year (laughs) and how many people that have sent in and said thanks for broadcasting that we weren't able to be there but it sure was a help to us I don't ever want to misconstrue the idea or the thought that there's any other reason for us being here than to try to help people Uh, I don't want to do anything but help people. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want people coming here and getting hurt. You shouldn't want to hurt people either. Do you even pause before you act to think about the hurt? You know these people love you and care about you and it matters to them. And when you do what you do, you do even pause. Do you even care? Imagine how the younger brother would have felt if he'd have heard what his brother said. I'm just going to say I bet it hurt. I've seen physical brothers act like Cain and Abel the whole life. You know what that Bible said? That Bible says you should be getting together and you should be fixing that thing. If you're the Christian you claim you are, you ought to take the wrong and you ought to go on for the cause of Jesus Christ, but you ain't man enough to do that. You're too worried about what somebody might think. Don't worry, they're not thinking about you, they're thinking about themselves. Well, if I come back there, what about this? The first thing to be, be a hypocrite meet you at the door, be a hypocrite see you in the parking lot, be a hypocrite go and meet you at the urinal or meet you in the toilet back there, be a hypocrite meet you back here in the north, there'll be a hypocrite standing in the pulpit. Well, preacher, I heard what you said back on such and such a sermon and such and such a day, and you said this, listen, as much as I run my mouth and as many times as I preach and talk, you should be able to find all kind of problems with me. You say, why? I got enough fleas on me to know the dog I am. It's not always pure water coming out all the time. I do my best to do that. But sometimes, you know, other things creep in. You know those parts where you think the preacher's in the flesh. The parts where you're under conviction, but it's the preacher was in the flesh. Instead of saying, oh, it might have been the Lord dealing with me. I just wonder about the hurt feelings coming at it from a different way. Uh, the hurt feelings of the, of the elder brother, the little, the, the, uh, the, the, the prodigal, if he heard, heard his brother say the what he did. You know, his brother sent out an Instagram or Snapchat or a Facebook post. I wonder if that would have kept him from coming back. I've often wondered when I look at that story, and I'm coming to these other things in a minute, I've often wondered when I look at that story, if the reason the prodigal hesitated as long as he did was because he knew the heart of the elder brother. I hope to the Lord God that made me that people refuse to come here because they're worried about the elder brother's attitude. If I could, I couldn't, but if I could, you know what I'd put right out there on the front over the door? Emergency room. Everyone welcome. I don't care color, race, creed, sex. And if you come in here and you're messed up, we'll fix you up. We're not having no sex change surgeries in here. We'll help you get solidified knowing the difference in a boy and a girl. Somebody confused you. We'll tell you the truth about those things to help you to get back on the right path because you've been running around with demented people that are as messed up as a soup sandwich. You say, well, I can't go there. Who said that? The only exclusions are pedophiles. And if you're one of those, you can leave now. Or you can just not come back after the service. Amen. And honestly, there is literally there's there there is no capitulation there whatsoever. Amen. I'm not, that that's just we ain't doing that. Well, can I come and I, you can watch online? 
Well, I got right. Good. You have done permanent damage to a kid and they're going to have to pay for that the rest of their life. You're going to pay the rest of your life because of the decision you made. Well, they falsely charged me and I, I heard that chin music for years. Where there's smoke, there's fire, sonny boy. We ain't dealing with that. You say, but what about the other weirdos? We got plenty of them, including one in the pulpit. Catch me on a bad day, you wouldn't think I was a preacher. I sweat just like you do. I know you find that hard to believe. I bleed just like you bleed. I get my feelings hurt just like you get your feelings hurt. Some of you think I'm the cotton-picking rock of Gibraltar and i got to hide like a rhinoceros. How do you know that? From the way you treat me sometimes. <laughs> I figure, you know, oh, he can take it, man. He's just a punching bag. Just punch him out, you know, that kind of a deal. You might want to realize, I'm, you know, you might be hitting my belly and there ain't a whole lot of... Uh, there's more of a barrel there now than a six-pack. <laughs> I'm not going to stand up and let you punch me intentionally. I was a foolish boy that did that years ago. But I done a little bit to maintain it. Nowadays, all I do is feed it. <laughs> but can I say this to you? Would people take you as a Christian saying that you're doing everything you can to protect the ones you're going to give in charge over? How's your attitude when you're away from church? Do you protect your loved ones? I mean, they're looking for a place to run. You know what I know, ladies and gentlemen? I know this. I know that if they hear what you say about other people, they'll think that's what you're going to say about them when they're not around. And you know what they're afraid of? They're afraid you won't protect them if they wind up saying, I'm vulnerable. Everybody in here has a vulnerable spot. See, so, preacher, did you see so-and-so today? Yeah, I saw him. The only reason you're bringing them to my attention is is because you saw something in them you didn't like and you're wanting to see whether or not I saw it and what I'm going to do about it. You say, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to help them. What are you trying to do? You say, what happened? Man, we get every kind of thing in the world here. But we should. We're not charismatic. It doesn't take them long to know where we are as far as our doctrine is concerned. But can I ask you a question before I move on to my points here? When somebody comes in, do you do what you can to protect them from the thing that got them in trouble before from pulling them back out again? Or do you just look down on them and go, well, I'd never do that. You make them pay for what they did after the Lord's already forgiven them? It's a good sermon. We should just close it right there and go home and go eat early if you feel like eating now. That Bible teaches you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, last time I checked, whosoever will, let him come. Did you ever look at who the Lord helped out when He was here on the earth? Did you ever look at who He ran with? That's a picture of how the church ought to be. People ought to be welcome. They ought to be able to come in here and say, it doesn't matter how I look and how I'm dressed and what's all going on. You say, why? I'm just looking for help. I've been in ER a few times. If you've been around any time at all, you've been in an ER. You know the oddest thing in an ER? You see the strangest people come in the ER. <laughs> and they're dressed in all manner. You know what they're looking for? The ER doctor to give them some help and the nurse to give them some comfort. They're just looking for help. Uh, my wife asked me uh, yesterday and she said, you know, what do people do when they didn't have a doctor to run to? I said, they laid there and suffered and they either got better or they died. Nowadays, you got a dock in a box on the corner, or you can pick up the phone and call somebody, and you can get, you know, antibody, you can self diagnose yourself and WebMD it, or whatever it may be, and all that other kind of stuff, or take somebody else's prescription, or whatever other illegal things you do to alleviate whatever problem you have. But the bottom line is this back in the day, there wasn't any doctor to run to. You either laid there and rested and got well, or of course you took castor oil. That was the cure for everything, including Ebola. But if you took uh, castor oil, that was about all you could do. They didn't have aspirin for headaches. They laid there and suffered. And they either got better, or they died. You say, what? They didn't load them up in the horse and buggy and run down to the local hospital and say, hey, can you treat me and hit me some antibiotics? weren't even around. We take a lot of that for granted. And I tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, there is not a church on every corner. And suffering people, when they find the right place to go to, they find the Mayo Clinic or the place that's got specialists and things like that. You know what they want? They want that kind of special treatment because they realize they're hurting. They have a problem. We have people in here that have had every kind of loss you can imagine. 
from babies all the way up, health all the way up, every kind of death you can imagine, disease, all that stuff. Do you ever think about that when people are here? Or do you just see them for what they are right now? Do you ever pause historically to think what they've been through? And they're still here? Amen. Without spouses? Without kids? Without babies? Amen. Without children? There's a bunch of people that have thrown in with you and I here. You know what? Their families won't even talk to them. They think they're in some kind of a cult because you believe a King James Bible. Boy, you better learn to get along with the people that you're in here with. And you better recognize that as much as you think somebody irritates you, you've irritated the star out of somebody else. But you'd never look in the mirror to see that. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be just persnickety. Can I use this word in the proper context? I don't want to be prejudicial to just people that are like me. I really do want to be like Jesus. You say, what is that? Whosoever will. I think I have an answer for you. I think I can help you. I think that I can do something that will make you better spiritually for eternity. I'd like the chance to help them. Amen. Amen. Only this kind can come, and only this kind can come. And every time you have a big meeting, you're going to have some people come in, and they're going to go, well, I don't know that I'd do that, and I don't know that I'd do this. Well, when the Lord puts you in that position, you can make that decision, but could you just be glad we had the doors open, and people had paid and had, had, had sacrificed in order to get the doors open? Well, I know that, but you know, I think you might, you might be, have a little chink in your armor there. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> One fellow asked me during the meeting, he said, so how do you do all of this? I said, do all of what? He goes, like this building and stuff. I said, "Uh, I threw gold in the fire and a calf came out. (laughs) I said, I can't explain that. I don't have any idea how all that happened. God did it. Oh, well, yeah, we know that. Well, then don't be asking me how it happened. God did it. I don't know why. I just know that it's supernatural in nature. And I want to take what God has done. But me, we have a wing in the hospital that is open up that has the name of Jesus on it. He bought it, He paid for it, and He is supplying the need for it. And I'll be jumped if I'm going to shut the door to anybody that wants to come for hell. Amen. Amen. That includes some of you who will leave before the year is over. You say, what happens? The door's open and you can come back. You've got to come back the right way. Can I give you just a couple of things here? Notice what he says in verse number 5, the number for death, judgment, destruction. Then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand. Can I say this? We're not going to turn loose of them without a fight. Do you go after them as hard as you're in a hurry to get them to leave? I remember the story of Jesus who'd been betrayed. Just a little thing there. He'd been betrayed by Peter and he told him he was going to betray him. Peter's an independent Baptist because even though the Lord said you are, he said I ain't. Some of you got that. Some of you are like, oh, that's not me. Wait till the sermon's over. The Lord said you go. No, Lord, he's talking to everybody else. He is not talking to me. And Peter betrayed him. And Peter got with the wrong crowd and Peter did everything he did. And not only that, he led people away. There's collateral damage. All those boys that were sitting around the table that promised not to desert him, Peter said, I go fishing. You know what they said? We go also. Man, what a mess. They all deserted the Lord. Have you ever read John chapter 6 verse 66 and 67? Will you go also? Well, they did. Every one of them, including John. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Yeah, we're going too. And they fished all night. Who's up on the beach fishing for them? Who's out there looking as a fisher of men? You say, who is that? Oh, that was Jesus. What did He do? Same thing He did in the Old Testament when Elijah got cattywampus. Did Elijah get cattywampus? How come it is that when Elijah left, God went after him? 
Theophany in the Old Testament, if you want to get hypersensitive about my theology this morning. Uh, that's Jesus Christ incarnate in the flesh in the Old Testament. You know what Elijah said? I'm done. I'm out. I quit. Good, you're in great company. And Elijah goes and sits under the juniper tree and he says, It is enough. Let me die. I'm done. And when he falls asleep from fatigue, when he wakes up, there's a crackling fire over there. Somebody's thrown a coat over him and there's a cruise of water there by his head. And here's the master sitting there across from that fire, messing with that skillet and stuff, getting that bread ready to come off of that thing. And he looks across that log of that burning fire sitting over there next to a log and he said, How are you doing? I don't think Elijah woke up and said, Praise the Lord, glory to God, I'm doing wonderful now. I think he thought, well, I'm ready to die. Are you here to take me? Because when you get that way, you know what you get? You get hypersensitive and anybody that's trying to help you, even though it's with food and water, you're thinking, they're here to hurt me, they're here to hurt me, they're here to hurt me. Can I just tell you, that's the devil. That's not you. That's not your soul. But you misunderstand. I, I know you're Bible theologians, you find it hard to believe. But it happens. And the Lord says, you hungry? No, I'm not hungry. Well, you look like you're starving to death. You hadn't had anything in about three days. Matter of fact, when Jezebel wrote you the letter, you stopped eating right there because things didn't work out the way you thought they were going to work out. And you said goodbye to your servant and you walked out on the back side of over, over here. Nowhere. Nobody knows where you are except me. Can I tell you right now, nobody knows where you are right now but Him. He knows exactly where you are right now. You say, what did he do? You got a GPS tracking system on you. You can't escape it. Sealed inside of you is the Holy Spirit of promise. You can't get away from Him if you want to. David said, though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Some of you did last night. You were in places you shouldn't be last night. I'll come to one of these cities in just a minute here. The Lord knows exactly where you were and exactly what you were doing, and exactly what you were saying. And then you come into church today, and you get this message, and the Lord's like, I told you. And you say, I realize you don't think this is hot bread and water, but I'm not done yet. And Elijah's sitting there, and the Lord comes to him, and he says, are you hungry? What are you doing out here? I, only I, have not bowed the knee to Baal. Really? Wow, I didn't realize I was in the presence of the fourth part of the Trinity. The presence of such greatness. The presence of such loyalty. Oh man, Elijah, let me get off of my log and get down on my face and worship you. Only you haven't bowed the knee to Baal, Elijah? That's right. Uh, Elijah, you're whacked out. Boy, there's 7,000 doing what they're supposed to do the way I want them to do it. Be careful about thinking you're the only one getting hit. Oop. He said, Elijah, I want to deal with you. Now we're talking about being hurt. We're talking about being hindered. We're talking about being hampered. We're talking about if I'm, if I'm using H's, all the things you've heard me talk about before, Elijah's messed up because he's been hurt. God's let him down. Right? The revival didn't come. Right? Isn't it interesting that God did all of His part and gave the people the free will to decide if they wanted to fall and they know what they said? We ain't doing it. I'm sure some of them thought that the sermon Elijah preached was not a good sermon. You say, why? He spent the whole first hour heckling the other prophets of Baal. I mean, literally having them in derision, making fun of them publicly. I'm sure they're like, that ain't no way for a preacher to act. But boy, after he called down fire, you know what his expectations was? That's it, man. Everybody's going to know now God's on my side. And he leaves and nobody was on his side and nobody even recognized him. You ever done something and you expect recognition and nobody recognizes you for it? 
And you think, boy, can't they see God's hand on me? And nobody even pays any attention to it. Well, after he gets done with that, you know what winds up happening? The Lord sits down there with him and he says, uh, Hey, listen, I want you to step out to the mouth of the cave there. You got your face covered up and you're over there in the man cave. He said, uh, Do you see me in the fire? And the earth cake and the wind? No, sir, I don't see in that. He said, I'm not in all that noise. He said, I'm in the still small voice, Elijah. And the problem is, you've gotten so far away from me and so far ahead of me, you've forgotten who's the boss. You think these people should do what you tell them to do because you tell them to do it? Overriding me, I gave them free will. That's my choice. That ain't your choice. You're outside your lane, boy. You done messed up. You think you're God. You remind me of a boy named Jonah. He goes over there and gets mad because I don't nuke the city because they all repented. And now you're thinking I should nuke the city. Well, 200 and something years later, he winds up doing it. But ladies and gentlemen, the problem is we're to do what we're supposed to do and God is left with results. We don't make results. Jonah said, you know, I'll go over there and do it. Why? Well, you put me in Whale Puke University here and had me go over there. And I went over there. By the way, preachers do cause storms and that's what happened. And he gets thrown over there. And when Jonah hits the beach over there, he goes over there and preaches about eight words in that message. And the entire city uh, repents. And the king is so under conviction, he even puts the animals on rations and puts them in sackcloth. He's like, Lord, I know this is coming and I'm letting you know I mean business and I'm trying to let you know I understand and I'm sorry for what I did and I'm going to even make my animals wear sackcloth. And Jonah says he's mad. He's sitting under the gourd. He didn't get his way. You know why Jonah preached that message? He preached that message because it was the final farewell. It was going to make him look good if after he preached that message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed, he preached that message thinking, they're going to know me as a prophet now. Call down fire and nuke a whole city. Man, they'll think I'm an Elijah. They'll think I'm something. And the Lord said, but they repented. He said, you know something? They're so stupid, I'll give you a paraphrased version, they don't even know their right hand from their left hand, and you're wanting me to destroy them now that they understood what they did. Great sermon, Jonah. You did a good job. They all repented. And Jonah is mad. And the thing ends with a question mark. You want me to nuke them, Jonah? Yeah, I do. For my reputation... The Lord said when He came, He was of no reputation, nor comeliness that we should desire Him. So when the Lord comes down here, He's about not doing any of that. You know what Jonah does? Yeah, I think you should nuke him. You say, what is that? That's how some of us are toward people coming home. Nuke them, Lord. Why? Make you look good? I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen. I can't speak and I don't mean to be... So yes, I do. I mean to be personal. <laughs> That's not true. I was fixing to lie there. I do mean to be personal. You know what I think that attitude comes from? You never have seen yourself as what you could be had the Lord not intervened. Or you would not be so stinking arrogant and obnoxious in your pride to think of yourself so much better than everybody else as if even at this moment you would never be in the position of whoever it is you hate. How about you consider this prayer for this week? Lord, thank You for being so gracious and merciful with me that You never put so much pressure on me that I went to the far country. God, You've been good to me. Because if You hadn't... I look at it this way. I look at it twofold. Number one, the Lord's given a bunch of people around me, a bunch of people that are always watching out for me. I don't call people friends if they're always trying to get me in trouble or let me get in trouble. I don't appreciate that at all. Sometimes they've said some things that may not be so kind. But you know what I realize? They must love me. I think the Bible says something about the, uh, the wounds of a friend. But you know what you do when a friend tries to help you with something? You get mad about it. 
Instead of saying, appreciate the heads up, appreciate the warning, appreciate the watch out, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I realize you must care because you know what? You're going to be hated by me for giving me a warning. I guess you hate every policeman out here that tells you to slow down instead of writing you a ticket. And gives you one of these as you're going by. <laughs> Who are you? Okay. All of a sudden there's a little tiny light on top of a motorcycle behind you. Did you see that policeman up there? Yeah, what did he tell you? He told me to slow down. Well, if you'd have heeded that warning, I might not be doing this. Amen. Have a nice day. Don't you hate it when they say that? They just ruined your day and then they say have a nice... Like they just, just, doesn't that bother you? It doesn't bother you. Y'all are so nice. You should tell him, have a nice day. I'm sorry I ruined your day and made you have to do this. You know, on the bumper of your car, in case of uh, rapture, this car will be unmanned. Then he pulls you over and says, huh, well, that's an interesting sign. I, I, I guess, are you a Christian? Well, why are you acting that way? Where do you go to church? Uh, AV 1611 Bible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ain't going there, man. You know what you should say? I shouldn't have been speeding. You want to watch them fall out? You know why I stopped you? Yes, sir, I was speeding. <laughs> I mean, before he can even get out driver's license, registration, insurance card, do you know why I stopped you? Yes, sir, I rolled through that stop and did a California roll, man. <laughs> sir? Sir? <laughs> sir? <laughs> you know what will happen? He'll get up. You'll be, the t you'll be his story for the next 30 days. You'll never believe. I stopped somebody and they told me the truth. <laughs> No, I don't know why you stopped me. You're profiling me. <laughs> You're just filling your quota. I don't have one. Would you like some more? <laughs> you got to practice a smile. Smile, you're on candid camera. Yeah, somebody's in the car with it, you know. And... Why are you smiling? Are you enjoying this? <laughs> you know better than answer. I refuse to answer a question on the grounds it might incriminate me. <laughs> yes, it's obvious that you don't understand a warning. You need something to get in your pocket. I don't know I must, uh, how close I am on time, sir. i got about 10 minutes. I ain't even going to make the cities. I want you to pause for a minute now. I want you to think of something. I want you to think of your greatest enemy. Saved enemy. Okay? I mean the one that did you wrong, wrong. And they decided to come back here. And say, can I come home? You know, when they're laying this city out in Numbers 35 and over in Judges, you know what it says? It says that the city is supposed to be set in a place that is easily visible from anywhere in the city, so it's up on a hill. It says, secondly, that there's not to be any stumbling stones or rocks in the way of an individual that's trying to, it's supposed to be easy package, passage, excuse me. When we were over in Moldova, there's a radio tower that was there. Vanya, who was the interpreter, knew about 1,500 languages. He's up there and I said, man, how in the world? Because the cities, I mean, the streets didn't make any sense. And certain places, like even here, you get a sense of how the streets run and they're either numerical or they're certain. You can learn them pretty quick, even without a GPS system. Back in my day, we had a map book, believe it or not, before all that other stuff. And so you learn the streets. Well, over there, man, I mean, it is a soup sandwich. And he took me out there to the side. He put his arm on me like this and he said, he said, you see that right up there? And I said, yeah, what is that? He said, that's a radio tower. And he said, that's literally the center of the city. You can get lost anywhere in the city, but you can still see that radio tower. And if you can find that radio tower, you can find the center of the city and you can get home from there. You know what the place of refuge is supposed to be? See that right there? You can get home from there. You hurting? Yes. 
You're helpless. You're homeless. You're hindered. Back to my question. Are you going to keep them from getting to the place they can get home from? I'm just asking. Is this your church? Belongs to you? And you determine? Blessed is a man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of sinners. I don't want to be that individual, Brother Larry, that when somebody's trying to get to Jesus, I'm in their way. I don't want to be Romans 10. I don't want to be a stumbling stone to them. Paul said, I can, but I can't. I've got to consider the weaker brother. I have to pay attention to what I'm doing. Why? Because it might make the weaker brother to stumble. Well, you meet and wine and drink and so on and so forth. You can, but if you do and it causes your other brother to stumble, the Lord holds you accountable for that. You say, what am I doing? I'm kind of getting in the way. The responsibility for being here. That prodigal decided to come home today. Could I ask you a question? Would it just irritate the stew out of you to see them come to an old-fashioned altar and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner? Because it's your enemy? Would you not want them to get right with God unless they got right with you? You mean you're more important than they are? You say, do you care? Oh, I care. You say, well, what, what, what have they done? It doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't say you can come back, but only if you haven't. Right. Here's what I do. I, I guess you could say I'm sort of shading the bet. Maybe I'm insuring against what might happen. If, if I'm being dead straight with you ladies and gentlemen, the opportunities to quit during 2023 have been more than they have ever been before. I mean to quit. Preacher, you you got to be kidding me. I mean, with everything we got going on, I, you didn't hear what I said. The opportunities to quit have been greater in 2023 than they have ever been before. Well, surely not, preacher. No, it's only by the grace of God I didn't. Yes, sir. So you have a bigger impact than you think, ladies and gentlemen. Things that you do make a difference. It's hard to stay in the Father's house sometimes. When you know what you're ready to do? You can have it. I'm done, I'm through, I'm out. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. Not the chances for you to quit, the chances for me to quit. Why haven't you quit? The grace of God and people praying yes, sir. and begging God. You say, what? Don't you put me on some stinking pedestal and think that I don't have the same feelings that you have and the same attitude that you have and the same depression that you have and the same discouragement that you have and the same letdowns that you have and the same burdens that you have. Amen. I have them, but by the grace of God, I would be out! Amen. And so would she! Amen. And to be honest with you, if I was her, it'd be easier for her to step away than it would be for me. You say, why? Because of all the stuff that she has to deal with and all the things that people have literally no concept. Um, it's not for a pity party. I'm just trying to be real with you. I don't want you to think that I'm preaching something I hadn't lived. If I don't stay with it, why you travel so much? To keep me out of trouble. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah. To keep me humble before God and beg God on a regular basis to give me the right message and the right information and the right counsel to give to people. Why? Because I am not strong enough. I need God's hand on me. Amen. It doesn't just, I wake up, oh, there it is. Where would I be without that? I'm telling you where I'd be without that. I'd be stuck up so far in the mountains. You would have to... Stop. You'd have to get a bush hog to get me out. You'd see me come down some scraggly weirdo freak -a -mo that would come down about every six months to the big chain store to get everything that he could get and you wouldn't see me again till springtime. 
Oh, surely not, preacher. For years, I tried to get a place up there and I was going to go up there and retire and be a chief of police or something up there with my experience and be able to do that. <laughs> and the Lord just kept shutting the door and shutting the door and shutting the door. And we're riding through that area one time and the old preacher said, can you come up around here? And I said, yes, sir. He hit the guy driving. He said, speed up, man. He said, this guy will bail out and we'll never see him again. <laughs> he said, he'll leave and let the whole world go to a bad place in a hurry. <laughs> And then he looked around and he said, ain't that right? I said, well, yes, sir. <laughs> you say, surely not. Oh, yeah. I'm over in Alabama last week, about 30 miles from Clear where my aunt and Papa were when it was nothing but a flashing light there in the middle of that thing and a train whistle stop through there and Cowart's drugstore was there and not much around in those days. I'm over there riding back and forth. Of course, it's blown up now different, but I'm riding back through those back woods and back hollers and those little hills and dales through there and I'm just sitting there quiet looking out the window and the Lord said, uh-uh, boy, mm-mm, no, uh-uh. Mm-mm, plain Thursday morning, get out of here. <laughs> I'm like, well, Lord, they want me to stay a couple extra days. and I, mm -mm. Back home, boy. I love being here. I love being with you people. But I have to be honest with you as your pastor, if it's not for God's grace and your prayers, I'm just as vulnerable to get out as you are, if not more so. Yeah. Preacher, that shakes my confidence. Well, pardon me for being honest. I don't want you looking at me like, he'll never get out. But by the grace of God... Amen. Amen. I'm not going to, but I can name you some preachers this year who said they'd never get out. And they're out. And they didn't get out for wicked, ungodly reasons. Adultery and all kind of stuff like that. They just had enough. I wonder sometimes if people that run preachers off take great solace in the fact we ran that preacher off. I wonder if they like are happy about that. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand that. Let me try to put a bow on the package here. I know we've got to be getting close to noontime. My stomach's growling. We eat on the clock, right? I don't want to be that person or preacher that keeps people that are legitimately trying to find help from getting to a place where they can find help. And I don't want to pastor a place that doesn't literally roll out the red carpet for whosoever will. Otherwise, what's the point? An old preacher, not the old preacher. He said one time, I'm talking about the church, and he asked me a ton of questions. I felt like I was being grilled for an exam or something. And he got done, he said, I got one more question, just one more question. I said, okay, lay it on me, man. Sky's the limit, man. I'm being laid bare. Go ahead. What is it? And he said, just one question. I said, okay. Fire. <laughs> he said, do you think Jesus would be welcome in your church? Long hair and a beard, sandals. Kind of a naysayer to what's going on around him in the world. Do you think if he came in, he'd be comfortable You know what my answer was? Sure, absolutely. No question about that. We're King James, Holy Bible, street preaching, fire breathing, hell hating, heaven loving. You know what I said? Well, I sure hope so. And he said, well, pastor, he said, I might just say to you, that's something that has helped me for a long period of time in the preparation of every message. He said, I look at a little sign on my desk. Would Jesus be welcome in your church? if he was looking for a place of refuge. That has to do not with the person, but the place they're coming to. Does that make sense to you? And if we don't do our part to make people that are not as fortunate as us, they're not raised on the King James Bible. They don't know about rightly dividing. We have little kids from Sunday school around here. They know more about the Bible than most pastors do. They go to visit over the Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays and stuff. You know what they do? They sit down there and they're like, Mom, he didn't rightly divide here and he didn't do this. He misquoted this scripture and they're doing this. And they're seven. 
Mom, we can't come back to this church. He's a compromiser. <laughs> Amen. Right? Sure. But there are other people who are coming to see us now and come from that background. Right. Right. They didn't come from the right Bible. They came from a messed up situation, a messed up problem, a messed up thing. And you know what they said? I think I'd like to try it here. Oh, good. You can be next. I came here, man. They treated me in the ER, man. I mean, man, I got some help a long time ago. They triaged me and moved me right to the front of the line. Really? Yeah. What do they do? Hang on, I know the charge nurse. So, well, they've made a mess of this and that and the other. Good. What better place to come get fixed up? Now, I will run the cities at another time. Can I just have your attention for just another second? I'd like for you to bow your heads for a minute. No music playing. I'd like for you to close your eyes. And whoever you're praying against, you need to realize this. Somebody's praying for and whoever it is you don't want to be here, somebody wants them to be here. And whoever it is that you may be against, only by the grace of God, God's not against you. And a lot of them are Christians. And they've messed up. Now, I, listen, I would not give them any more rope than God's given you. Don't you give them another inch than God's given you. But if you're praying for somebody to come back, how about you get up from where you are right now and find your way down here to the altar and by your testimony, I'm praying for somebody to come home. I bet you that prodigal's father prayed every night. Boy, come home, come home. Ye that are weary, come home. Praying on the behalf of somebody else. And when you're praying for them to come home, ladies and gentlemen, pray that none of us will get in their way. Pray for us too. Because sure as I'm standing here, somebody will do or say something so stupid that if they're looking to be offended, you know what they'll do? They'll get out. God spoke. You come now. Come on. You're praying for somebody. You want them to come back. What a great time of the year. A great time of the year for what? For you to be on behalf of uh, someone else. Thanksgiving, Christmas time. For you to be praying. How about it, mama and daddy? Sister, brother? Husband, wife? Kids? There's nobody involved in that if you're saved that's not touched by that. Pray for them to come home and pray that the ones that are home, we don't get in the way when they get ready to come home. You say, what matters? Their spiritual condition when they die. Our feelings don't matter. Do you hear me? Our feelings don't matter. What He wants is what matters. And some of you may be seated there this morning after the first part of the invitation. And maybe you're seated there because you're pretty upset with the Lord. He hadn't done things the way you thought He should do them. And so you're in the desert under the juniper tree. And you're saying, it's enough, Lord, I'm done. You say, who's susceptible to that? The greatest preacher in the Old Testament. One of the greatest preachers, Jeremiah, in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul, when he got caught up in his Phariseeism and almost missed the Lord until he got knocked in the dirt and blinded. Who is that? Peter, full of himself. Oh, well, preacher, when you say that, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty much great. Moses comes along there and, and his... Out there, he's out of the will of God. He's backslidden conditioned. Forty years he's been away from what God would have him to do. And he sees a bush burning over there to the side. There's not a bunch of heat waves raising up. And the Lord says to him, uh, Take off your shoes. The ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. He's talking about a land grant there. But more than that, you know what he's saying? 
He's saying, I'm ready to put you back in, Moses. Lord, after all I've done, I've been out 40 years. Yeah, come on home. How about it, Moses? Me and you, we make a majority. Don't you reckon he got some ridicule? Why, if you read the Bible when he got back, you know what they accused him of? They accused Moses of saying, the only reason you're doing that is you're making things worse for us and worse for us, and it's your fault. I mean, man, he got it put on him, but he stayed true to doing what God told him to do. Boy, we could use a little of that today. Heavenly Father, thank You for these by their own testimony that have come praying for someone other than themselves and help those of us who recognize in reading this story that we could easily, by accident, not intentional, didn't intentionally walk out the door and run to the far country like the prodigal, never even saw ourselves in the pig pen when we did leave. But God, that we might pause and ponder, but by the grace of God, I wouldn't even be in church today. But by the grace of God, I wouldn't even be saved. But without your guidance and direction in my life and you controlling everything, I wouldn't even be standing here. I'm sure I'd either be dead or in a ditch somewhere without any question. God, help us to be a hospital to others, a place of refuge, a place that when people come in here and they're lame and they're blind and they're leprous and they have the problems that they have that we're with open arms say welcome home and we'll do what we can to try to do for them what you've done for us until they till they also do the same unto others please bless this day lord as we prepare ourselves just a week away from thanksgiving a week or 10 days lord that we might pause and ponder that we owe you a deep debt of gratitude and that we might realize that we should spend a little bit more time thanking You for being so good to us. And that we also ought to be that to others. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Alright, thank you for your attention this morning. And I'm sorry I didn't get to those six cities, but we'll get to them at another time. And uh, Lord willing, 2.45 to set up upstairs and 3.45 play practice in here and 4.45 church. God bless.